cultural origins of superstitions, along with some famous clairvoyance and mediums. Now, I have to tell you this, she has in the write-up murderers and mysterious deaths on the canal, but those exciting things you may have to see her afterwards to ask about. At any rate, Pamela Vittorio, take it away. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? So I grew up on the Erie Canal. It was probably my first and favorite playground where I rode my bicycle on the towpath. And you know, back in the 70s and 80s, we didn't have cell phones, so we didn't have to text or call our moms to tell them when we'd be home for dinner. <laughs> we just took our cool late canteens, got on our bicycles, and you know, made a 26-mile round trip from Chittenango to Canastota and sat at the aqueduct and uh, enjoyed the, the nature that the canal had to offer. So I never imagined when I was a kid that we would have the Erie Canal, uh, Erie Canal Boat Landing Museum, and that you know, some 30 years later, without dating myself too much, uh, that I would be giving presentations about the history of one of my favorite places. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the superstitions of the canalers, and they definitely were a very superstitious lot. And the one thing that they were pretty much afraid of was spooks. They didn't like, uh, they didn't like the idea of dead people's spirits haunting the towpath and the various environs of the canal. So our agenda today, this is our eerie agenda. Don't you love that pun? I mean, come on, how could I avoid it, right? Uh, we'll talk about some of the superstitions and where they came from. Some eerie places on the eerie. And then, so probably little known fact is that there were clairvoyance and mediums that were dotted all along the canal, and uh, some played sort of a large role in the uh, spirituality that arose in the mid 19th century. So here's our, our wonderful canal stretching from Albany over to Buffalo. And of course, this is the enlarged canal which was completed in 1862. Do all of you know when the Erie Canal was begun, when they started digging? What year? 1875. Good, 1817. So they broke ground at Rome on the 4th of July. What a good day to do that. And a little known back to probably most of you here, except for a few people from Chittenango that I see, is that the little section from Rome over to Chittenango was actually completed around 1818. And we dug our own canal, thanks to Mr. Yates, who uh, was one of our, our big supporters and financial backers. And so the little Chittenango Canal connected from Old Clinton's Ditch all the way down into the village of Chittenango, and it had a little turnaround basin, and then those very narrow boats back then could go down and come back up and deliver their goods. So we actually find some instances of passengers who traveled between Rome and Chittenango and then as it expanded over to Syracuse and expanded over eastward toward Albany, you find little instances of passengers very, very early on using the canal either for transportation or to bring commodities to and from different places. But it must have been a very exciting time for them, if we think about it. And those people who came over as immigrants and saw, oh, I have a great opportunity to get a job. Well, a lot of them you probably know were the Irish, right? There's a big myth that the Irish dug the Erie but it wasn't just the Irish. The Irish consisted of probably about 30 to 35 percent of all the canal laborers. There were Germans, there were uh, Brits, Dutch, uh, Scottish, but the Scottish, you know the Scottish, they, they tend to like to be engineers. They don't want to be doing the digging. So they left the Irish to do the digging. And Irish navvies, of course, had a lot of experience digging canals back in England. So they could travel over and, you know, England was full of canals. So it was an easy job to get to be a laborer 
come over and uh, have that experience here somewhere along uh, that wonderful route. So the population along the canal is generally about a 25 mile radius from the canal on either side. So communities weren't just the people who were on the boats themselves, but the people who lived along the canal, worked along the canal, um, in the little towns and villages that dotted the canal, as they grew over the 19th century, they were part of that canal culture. Even if they didn't see themselves as canalers, as sometimes they call them, which canal folk didn't like called at all. But the canalers had their own culture, their own language. And when I say language, I mean in the sense of a the dialect. They used different vocabulary words for things. They had different pronunciations for things. And you could, if you were to hear it, you would think it was really an amalgamation of German and Irish and English and Scottish and Dutch, all those languages kind of melded into one. The Irish themselves, the population grew, rose to about 40%, 43% after 1821, that big boom of the, the first Irish immigration wave. And they consisted, as I said, of about a third of the workers. German and Dutch, you probably know a lot about German and Dutch uh, in the Palatine region on the Mohawk, and so a lot of our early settlers were Dutch, and then of course German, and then as I mentioned, the British, Welsh, and Scotch. So this article that uh, I ran in order to sort of glean some of these details was printed in, in the 1880s in a Brooklyn newspaper by this fellow named Michael O'Shea, and Michael, he called himself Michael O'Shea, the gas drip bar. Now, the reason he called himself the, the gas drip bard and people sort of gave him that epithet was because after he had worked on the Erie Canal, he got one of the first jobs maintaining all the gas lines down in Brooklyn. And so if he had a leak, that was the man you called to come and fix it. And he was a pretty interesting Irish fellow, but he, he romanticized the Erie Canal so much that he decided to go and sign up to be a driver. He knew nothing about driving, he knew nothing about mules, so his experiences were quite funny. And he wrote a lot of articles for the Brooklyn Eagle. Now, I live in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is a very funny place, if you've ever been there. It's really a mishmash of all different ethnic groups. And over the past 30 years that I've lived there, I've seen it grow from being an Irish and Scandinavian and Italian neighborhoods to kind of the little Middle East and Chinese neighborhoods and Russian neighborhoods. So, so it's very international. But back in the day, there were little enclaves of Irish in Brooklyn and a lot of the boatmen in the winter would go to Brooklyn and tie up their boats in the Erie Basin. So this is a little funny story, but I played the Irish tin whistle when I was studying Irish language. And it took place at a pub in Brooklyn, not too far from the water. And one day I looked out and I said, gee, this place looks really familiar. Why would I know it? Now, I meant it in a sense of like, in my mind, I could kind of see the outline of it like I'd seen it somewhere before. And sure enough, when I did a little research, I'd seen it on the map but from a map of a hundred and something years ago, because that was the area where all the canal, canal guys used to come and tie their boats up, right there where I was sitting and playing all the time, which was a weird coincidence. Um, so the Irish there were hardy, they were very superstitious, and all those superstitions were things that they brought over with them. And here are some workers. These are older guys, too. You know, they would be working until they were in their 60s or 70s if they could still dig and, and use an axe. So some commerce, common superstitions that they had, the Irish brought with them lexicon, um, their lexicon of, you know, words like leprechaun and pixie and fairy, um, probably all known to us, shamrocks, shillelaghs, and an Irishman could actually conjure up a spirit, so they said. When they initiated a new boy, who we called Hoggy, but a driver boy, a lot of them were called Hoggies, and they were 
get initiated into rites where they had to sort of prove whether or not they could withstand the trip on the towpath because a lot of them wouldn't even budge where they were supposed to drive the boat down the um, canal. They wouldn't even budge on the towpath if they thought they were in an area where there were some spooks. So you'll see this in a little bit. Snakes on the towpath. Where do you think the idea of snakes came from? Take a guess, right? St. Patrick, driving the snakes out of Ireland. Well, apparently, when they got here, it was something fearful for them to encounter snakes, either on the towpath or in the water. There was a boatman named Joe, and he was from Ireland. And one day he saw a huge congregation of water snakes in the canal, and the boat came to a stop. And so what he did was, um, he started talking to a kid that was on board, a new Irish kid. He was breaking him in as a hockey and a scuffle somehow came about. And the kid fell overboard, right near all the snakes. What do you think happened? You think that the snakes might attack that boy or something? No. When those snakes saw that Irish lad coming, they skedaddled. <laughs> and off they went. And that gave Joe an idea. Hmm, he said to himself. Whenever I have Irish passengers aboard, I know now what I'm going to do. I'm going to get them to get some Irish field dirt, carry it with them in their pockets when they get aboard, and then we toss it in and all the snakes will be gone. And so that's what they started doing because of this old Joe, the boatman, the skipper, that he would get all of them to go out whenever they, whenever they got to a stop and they would sprinkle some field dirt along the towpath and throw it overboard and the snakes would be gone. I don't know if it always worked. Sometimes, though, mules would encounter snakes. And mules, as you probably know, are not like horses at all. They're actually a little bit smarter, but don't tell the horse that. And the mules would stop dead in their tracks because they would not, um, they would not move if they saw a snake on the path. So the little driver boys, again, would have to go out and do something like sprinkle some dirt, hope that the snake moved. Um, sometimes they would use sticks that kind of look like shillelaghs. They'd have a snake stick. But they're, they brought with them from Ireland these funny superstitions. Another one was to nail a horseshoe to the door or above it. Now, this one, of course, also the Pennsylvania Dutch were known to do. And again, the German, the Dutch, with their cultural heritage, the Irish copied that to some extent. So all of those canal boatmen learned from each other, and they would put horseshoes above any kind of an opening to bring them good luck. The difference was, though, if somebody gave you a horseshoe, that wasn't good luck. You had to find it. So if you found it and you picked it up, kind of like a nice shiny penny, then you'd have some good luck. But if you got one for a gift, oh no, you, you better toss it and let somebody else find it for the good luck. Now, they also liked to do things like wish. Now, curiously, as we were coming over on the uh, Pompeii Center Road, I looked out into a field and I saw a farmer's barn. And in it, there were a whole bunch of hay bales. And I said, uh oh, that means if I'm going to have good luck, I'm not, my luck's not going to come to me until those hay bales get destroyed. So if you're passing hay bales when you're on the canal, it's supposed to bring you good luck. But the good luck doesn't come until the hay bale is knocked down, which means that you probably want to come back the other way and see if that it happened or not. So that was one thing. Shooting stars and uh, first star. And I think when we're kids, we all learn this, right? Starlight, star bright, first star that I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might have this wish I wish tonight. Well, they used very similar old sayings. So if they saw a star in the sky when they were sailing in the canal, the first person to make a wish would hope that their wish would come true. Um, the funny thing about the hay bales, like I said, is if, if you saw them when you were passing by, your wish wouldn't be granted until those hay bales were destroyed and distributed. So I guess with all the trips they did back and forth, they just have to keep a lookout. They wish on a new moon. And of course, 
big wish on four-leaf clover if they could ever find one. There it is. Now, some of the superstitions that the canalers had were very similar to the superstitions of mariners at sea. I don't know if you know anything about what the Erie Canal boatmen's personalities were like, but they tended to see themselves as right party individuals who were just as seaworthy as any captain on any ship anywhere. You know, it didn't matter that they were on old, old murky fresh water, <laughs> you know, that came in through some kind of a culvert when they let the water in. They saw themselves as a very uh, apt seamen. And the one thing that they did take from the culture of the mariners was that you better put a new broom on your boat. So when you christened your boat, you put a new broom there to bring good luck. And to ward off witch hexes. Now there were some witches around back in the day. I actually found some newspaper articles that said there was this old witch over at Montezuma. And if your boat was crossing through there, and she was coming out of her little shack, you better beware. Because if she put a hex on your boat or you didn't bring her some molasses or something, you could, you know, something bad might happen. You're, you might encounter a break on the canal and then suddenly your boat would be capsized or sunk in the mud and that would be horrible. So they were very particular about these things. So the new broom on the bow was one of their superstitions that they carried with them. And you know what they say, new broom sweeps clean. That looks pretty good. But it was also bad luck to do certain things. And one of which, just like the Mariners at Sea, was to rename your boat. If your boat was named the Sadie Hughes, and your wife was named Sadie, but then she passed on and you married somebody named Mary, you don't change the name of your boat. It's bad luck. But if you were going to do that, you would have to have a whole ceremony. And a boat renaming ceremony was a a big pain because you'd have to write something on a piece of paper, fold it up, put it in a little wooden box, burn the whole box to get rid of the bad luck that went with it, and then scoop up the ashes and throw them into the water. Now, if you were a boatman who couldn't write, you would have to find someone who did to write the name of your boat for you. Then you could have a new boat christening ceremony, which very similar to when you've seen, you know, boats christened, big yachts break a bottle of champagne in the bow, you rename it. They would put a new broom on the boat and they would also put a wreath on the boat to bring you good luck. And then you say this whole spiel about may, it, may fair winds be behind it and bring you it, bring it good luck and bring you easy sailing. Well, the boatmen and the mariners had some similarities in terms of superstitions, but I thought it was interesting to look at how they were different because if you know anything about pirates on ships at sea, or old ships, galleons, one of the things they didn't like was no women on board, right? No women. However, boatmen really couldn't exist very well unless their cook was a man, and they didn't have a wife. So on the canal boats, you would find, of course, women taking care of their kids, Sometimes a cook, she was, might have been a single woman, she might have been married to the steersman. So that's a big difference. And if you had a male child, that was good luck. So male kids were good luck. And that's where the, uh, the expression son of a gun comes from. So all be a son of a gun? Well, if a child, a male child was born up near where the gun deck was on the boat, then that was good luck. And so that's where it came from. They would also avoid certain terms, the canalers, like goodbye and drown. I don't like drown. <laughs> so they would avoid those. And they certainly didn't like the number 13, which I'll show you in a minute. Thursdays and Fridays were unlucky days. And if it were Friday the 13th, they weren't going anywhere. Now, gingers, meaning red haired, primary red haired people, most sailors didn't like gingers. They thought gingers were bad luck. Poor gingers, right? And then what are you supposed to do if you're Irish or you're German and you're a ginger? And that's a big trouble. But you would find a lot of fiery, red-haired cooks 
on boats and lots of descriptions. So that was a big difference. The canal men weren't worried. In fact, more times than not, I would read something about a fiery haired, red, red haired cook who would get into scraps with people and she would be, um, you wouldn't want to mess with her if she'd whack you with her iron, broad iron pan. Now there's something on the canal called a hoodle dasher. And a hoodle dasher is when they tie two boats or more up and they bring it up the Hudson River because between New York City and Albany, of course, you couldn't have a mule towing your boat. It just wouldn't work. The Hudson is way too wide. The rivers are, are it's very treacherous sometimes, um, as I'm sure some of you know if you've been down the Hudson. And so what they would do is they would have a steamboat. The steamboat would tow a lot of canal boats up to Albany, and then from Albany they would either uh, unload their commodities or they would get passengers to board from there and then take them to Buffalo. So this idea of the hoodle dasher took some research because a lot of people ask me, where does that word come from? And it's a strange word. But I kind of figured it out that back in the canal when you said a hoodle dasher, it was kind of like a whatchamacallit. So a newspaper article talks about it being, you know, the same sort of expression in the beginning. Well, we came up in one of those whatchamacallits, you know. So they called it a poodle dash. And then the boats, uh, you know, with their mules on board, were towed up the Hudson. And back in Ireland, I found a book I was reading where they called two wagons tied to each other a hoodle poodle. Now, as I said before, if you carry your language with you, it was pretty likely that some vocabulary words you used back in Ireland, you were going to bring over. So to hoodle someone, Reminds you probably of hoodwink. Yeah, um, means to kind of put the put the evil eye on or, or cast a bad spell. And this is just another story about it. Finding that um, for bad luck, if there was a chance of a hoodle, a person wouldn't wouldn't take it. So something that they encountered that could cause them some sort of superstitious, eerie, creepy. That luck thing was a hoodle. But again, see, there's no real definition. It's kind of like, eh, you know, which of a call it. And this is a hoodle dasher. So if you imagine that being tied up together dashes the hoodle, you should never go with just one boat. They always had two or more for good luck. So to dash the hoodle or the bad luck, you make a hoodle dasher. Kind of makes sense, right? I thought it was a good theory. Now the number 13, everybody knows about the number 13 being bad luck, right? You can go to a lot of buildings and there's no 13th floor. I was in a building not that long ago and it didn't have a 14th floor. And I was like, huh? Why? <laughs> but apparently it was another superstition because it was in Chinatown. And apparently the number 4 and the number 14 are not lucky for them. But 13, yeah, bring it on, no problem. Like, okay. We're not, we're just skipping from 12 to 14 or I'm taking the stairs. Anyway, canal boatmen were so superstitious about Friday the 13th as a start date. When that happened back in June of 1913, they said, nope, we're not going today. We're not opening. And so no boats went out on the Erie Canal. So no commodities moved anywhere and no passengers because it was a Friday. So they just said, that's it. We'll open on Friday the 14th, or Saturday the 14th, that's fine with us. And that's what they did. Now I'm going to tell you about some eerie places. Well, Herkimer, Herkimer has a lot of very interesting things that it's known for, right? The Herkimer diamonds. But Herkimer is also known for having one of the most haunted locks and this was because, here's a few of little falls, such a pretty area. There's her car. Now, something happened back in the 1800s at the lock in Herkimer. The lock keeper there was apparently a very jealous husband. And his wife was kind of interested in another boatman. And 
a murder took place, which was gruesome. And since we have children present, I will not talk about it. <laughs> but the lack tender is apparently, after the wife died, her spirit haunted the lock. And any lock tender who stayed in that shack there didn't sleep well. And this went on for a long period of time that they couldn't sleep because there were mysterious things happening, banging, clanging, bad luck things, people getting stuck in the lock, boats uh, being wrecked. So finally, the last lock tender said, that's it, I've had it. We're just gonna build a new shanty. And that's gonna get rid of the ghost, and apparently it did. And this is an article about it that was in the newspaper. And they said that if you've ever gone through that lock, then you know the strange, uncanny feeling as the boat glides quietly in in an awful coldness and gloom and a strange <laughs> charnel smell, which I suppose was because the, the spirit was old, but also because the lock keeper without a wife didn't take very good care of his shanty. So the ghost of the lock was a very popular tale. And there's just another view of it passing through the other side. And here's the Viking going through the same lock, lock 18. And that's much later, 1893. Now a lot of a lot of the canal um, was dotted with cemeteries. The cemeteries were kind of close to the side of the canal banks, so you could see them sometimes either on the towpath side or the other side of the canal, which is called the berm. A hockey, a mule driver, was typically not apt to want to cross in front of that cemetery, and some of those guys it would take all of their gumption to be able to drive the mule past the cemetery, because they didn't want to. They thought that it was haunted, that there would be spooks coming out, and a lot of times there were. There are some interesting cases of, of ghosts uh, arising from cemeteries and scaring the hobby or the driver or the steersman so much that one of them actually fell over the side of the boat and into the water and had to be dragged out and was shaking and shivering and couldn't talk for three days. Here's more Perkmer. Now there's a very eerie place along Utica where I, I wasn't gonna get into all the murders too much today, but there is an interesting strip of Utica known as Dead Man's Row. Now apparently that was the most haunted most spiritually active area on the canal. And again, there were lots of instances where these boat drivers, the captain would always tell the, the mule driver to get down and make sure that they went through. Even if it was after midnight and the light wasn't very good, but they'd go by moonlight. And these little drivers did not want to do that. They'd be like, no, I can't, because there's spooks there. And the captain would be like, ah, get out there, lad, there's no spook. And again, the poor kid would think he saw a ghost, would sometimes have to fight with the ghost, and end up in the drink. And no one ever knows exactly how they'd end up in the drink, because, I mean, you have to be kind of really far over to the side to fall into the canal. Apparently, that happened. So here's Utica. That really nice strip there. And the place that could be so beautiful by day was so eerie by night, especially in the fog, where they would not travel. Now this is the little section up here of the canal where the Dead Men's Row began. I suppose that because of the taverns, the number of taverns that were there, and that that was kind of a seedy part of town, that side of Canal Street in Utica, um, that's probably why there were so many deaths and murders. Guys would fight coming out of the bars. And, you know, as we said at the very beginning, canalers themselves were very scrappy. So a ghost might scare him, but some big lug who just came out of a, a tavern who's half drunk apparently didn't scare him that much. And they would just get into a big row and 
if the guy went to the drink and drowned, or they'd stab him and he'd fall into the drink and drown, that, that's what happened. And so there were an inordinate number of those occurring. And so probably that's where the whole idea of Dead Man's Road came from. And there was a house on the way that apparently was one of the most haunted houses. Couldn't be bought, no one would purchase it. And it was near the towpath, and there had been a murder committed there. And two brothers had lived in it, and this is from an old book. And, um, you know, it just became known as a haunted house because the spirits and the horrible things that had happened there. Well, eventually, eventually they called some Ghostbusters. And this is from like, the late, uh, late 1910s, oh, 1913 it was. And it happened on June 13th, 1913. So the same day that those canalers didn't want to go on their boat, they decided to remove the hoodoo from this house this scary house that most canalers didn't even want to pass by. And that's what they did. They had some guys go in there. They made $100 to go in as Ghostbusters and get rid of those. So who are you going to call, right? Even in the early 1900s, you could call a Ghostbuster. This is the strip uh, not too far from where that house was. And again, a view from the bridge. And this is an old canal boat. Um, this one in particular, not too far from Dead Man's Room. And it does kind of look eerie, doesn't it? Now, to wind up for our afternoon, I'm going to tell you a little bit about clairvoyance and mediums and eerie folk. Um, the idea of clairvoyance and mediums and sort of the supernatural is, is probably something we think is attributed to people from the 19th century. But then, if we think about the Reagan era, you guys all remember the Reagan era? When, Mr., uh, when President Reagan and, and Mrs. Reagan would consult with an astrologer to get an idea of what the year was going to be like. Well, so this idea goes back to the 1800s. And clairvoyants were pretty popular, so if you look in newspapers, you might find them. And here's one in Utica. William Doyle, this is in the Utica um, directory. William Doyle is living <laughs> on 89 Washington Street, and he's a clairvoyant healer. So these guys would put their advertisements in the newspapers and claim that if you come to them, they could you know, prognosticate what your health was, and they could see what was wrong with you. I don't know if it, if it really worked. I haven't found any, uh, I haven't found any significant evidence to the fact that anybody said, oh yeah, I went to a clairvoyant, he fixed me up good. And here's another one on Washington Street, there were two of them. This one, Myron Grego, living in the same place, so apparently they were in cahoots. And I liked at the bottom that there was a furnishing undertaker, <laughs> not too far away. And a doctor. Yep, and a doctor, a real doctor and surgeon, Dr. Krim. And notice he had to put his name in big, big letters and caps, right? But I'm the real doctor here, not those quacks. Now here's an advertisement also from the newspaper that I found. And notice again, Washington Street. This one is a Professor Marnett, clairvoyant and palmist, and he had a great reduction in the price. So for 50 cents, you could get a reading. I don't know if a canal would necessarily want to run over there if he were docked at Utica. But um, I, I suppose that Mrs. Redmond did a lot of good when a canal was having some scrap with his wife. She could settle lover's quarrels and reunite the separated. She also taught me personal magnetism. Whatever that means. <laughs> They weren't the most magnetic people either. Now over in Auburn, you could get clairvoyant exams for free. See, so you just run over to Auburn and Dr. Butterfield would fix you right up. And uh, he had hundreds, I guess, of patients with so-called incurable diseases that he restored to health. And that was his newspaper article. Now if you think about it, to put an ad in the paper like that back then, 
It probably cost a pretty penny, so he was making money from somebody. We know with our trial <laughs> Pre-diagnosis. And in tunnel one to two. So we find these clairvoyants popped up all along the canal. And this guy, or this woman, I should say, Mrs. Whitcomb, was a psychic clairvoyant. Now you might wonder, why did all these clairvoyants arise? Where did they come from? Who got the idea, who thought that it was a good idea to advertise yourself as a clairvoyant? Well, you might know that at one point in our history, especially in Western New York State, um, there was a lot, there was a huge, huge movement towards spirituality and with all the different denominations of Christianity that arose in the 1800s. Western New York State, particularly, became known as the Burned Over District because they had been proselytized to the point that they were just burned over, burned out. There was really nothing more you could do there. So along with the clairvoyance, we also saw the advent of mediums. Now, I was surprised to find out that there were some mediums who actually traveled on the Erie Canal, and they were quite famous. That's the Burned Over District in the western part of the state. But you see, after Syracuse, it really takes up a, a pretty large area there. Because remember, we've got 363 miles to deal with. In this little place called Hydesville, which doesn't exist anymore, it's a small village, not too far from Newark, this is in Wayne County, there were two young girls and their mother, they were known as the Fox Sisters, all three of them. Leah was the mom. She was born in 1814, so right after the War of 1812. And then the two girls, uh, Maggie and Kate, and they both died in the late, uh, early 1890s. Well, the girls started it all out as just kind of a, a joke, and they felt that they had encountered a spirit, and I guess they called them split hoof, and they did this wrapping and they pulled the wool over their mother's eyes, apparently. And this whole idea of communicating with spirits then started. Now what they didn't realize is that they were starting a trend. Because due to the fact that that whole burned over district had been so engaged in the concepts of spirituality and spiritual changes, that the, this idea of sort of parapsychology and the occult really took off. So everybody was getting interested in it. And there they are, the mom and the, and the two sisters. They kind of do look eerie, don't they? This is from an old daguerreotype portrait. Um, so they were all over the news. And they really believed that they were encountering spirits or contacting spirits. And one of these, uh, Preachers kind of took them under his wing. And they traveled from Hydesville all across the Erie Canal. They were known to levitate tables. Not that high. <laughs> you know, painters and artists back then exaggerated. That would have really freaked me out. And this is the, the little house where they lived apparently um, the Heights, uh, in Heightsville, Old Heightsville. The sister's house is still there. But that whole sort of mystical area, I think, is called Arcadia. And um, this one down in Lilydale was a, was a rep representation of that place. Here it is, from the Hudson Valley Halloween magazine back in the 1890s. Now, at the end of her life, um, the mom started to write her ideas down in a diary about some of the spirits they'd encountered, what they did, how they did it, and their seances. And this was um, something they called radical spirits. So a lot of their first person accounts are found in there. And the Fox sisters' story that was connected to the Erie Canal was very interesting because they were traveling by packet boat. Um, from Wayne County over from Syracuse to Rochester. And when they got there, they, I guess they said they um, found an old 
haunted house. And of course, that's where they lived, and it was quite fitting. But they went and they didn't want people to know that, that what they had been doing was a big hoax. So when they were on the boat, they were, somebody was doing that. Tapping, tapping, tapping. And that that was the way the spirits were contacting them. The rapping sound, and they said, oh, no, the rapping sound has followed us. And the passengers themselves, I guess, were, um, you know, rather shocked. And the spirits got bold and started to rap more loudly, and this is also from her account. And she says, they rap loudly and occasionally one end of the table would jump up and nearly spill the water out of our glasses. But there was so much noise on the boat going through the blocks and other disturbances that only we who recognized the special sounds knew of them. And she didn't really want people to know what she'd been doing, so this is what she was writing in her diary at the end. Around the end of her life, though, Kate, the younger daughter, admitted that this was a hoax. So in 1888, after probably 30 years, of making money off of people who believed in their ability to contact the other world, the other realm. They said, okay, it's been a hoax. It was too late though, because there was now this huge movement in spiritualism that probably wouldn't have been what it was if, had it, if it hadn't been for the Fox sisters. But she said she regretted it, and it was a curse. And they both, they all died before, uh, you know, they really were old women. None of them lived that long. So a soothsayer bids you to beware the eyes of March. <laughs> and this is the conclusion of my presentation today. And I thank you. And this book here, um, I will just leave you with. This is, this was Mudlarks off of the Chittenango Landing. And so this boat was later found sunken. But there was a mysterious story that went with that boat of three kids back in the early 1920s. And um, the waters were murky, and one of the boys dared one of the other boys to jump into the canal. And he did, or he didn't want to, and they pushed him. And when they pushed him, he went in head first, and he got stuck, and he drowned. Well, the kids covered it up, and so their entire lives, they didn't tell anyone what had happened until they were all on their deathbeds. And the first kid, the kid who pushed him, like, died of a horrible death of cancer at the end of his life. The sister was with him. She kept the secret until the end of her life. And the third guy confessed it on his deathbed. So apparently they felt cursed because of the horrible thing that had happened there in that beach nut that sunk. And it's still there, a chitney. So thank you very much, and I'll field any questions if you have questions. So at Chittenango Land and Canal Bowl Museum, we always have a lot of events, uh, at least one per month. We're doing something next week on the suffragettes of the Erie Canal, so I'll be talking about them. But this summer, we have our 30th anniversary. So on Father's Day in June, we will be celebrating 30 years of the Chittenango Land and Canal Bowl Museum, and it'll be a big day. We're gonna have, we always have a chicken barbecue, so people come from miles around to, to buy chicken dinners. But um, there will be three different bands, um, a group from Jordan called Mary Mischief, a local rock band, and another band playing. Um, so it'll be very nice music. And there will be a lot of activities, and our, all of our buildings on the site will be open. So if you haven't ever been there before, it's a great day. It's a, you know, pay what you wish. Um, so it's basically free. And if you make a donation, that's great. 
but it will be a very fun day and we're hoping to have Nancy Lorraine Hoffman there with us too. So we have that connection between us, don't we, with Nancy Lorraine. Anyway, thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate it.